The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, we thank you that you, uh, you tell us that wherever we gather, even two or three of us in your name, that uh, you'll be there with us. We thank you for your presence, your presence with us uh, as we meet, as we talk about you, as we think, as we read. Uh, give us wisdom and insight today as we think about uh, the ancient world, as we think about how ancient Near Easterners, um, including your people, Israel, uh, think about how you and how divinity in general relates to the world of stuff. Uh, give us eyes to see and ears to hear you at work in this ancient stuff that we're going to talk about today, but also in the world around us. Amen. Amen. Well, <clears throat> so uh, to, this is uh, uh, one of our class sessions of the Bible, Bible and Theology class session. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, incarnation in the ancient world, part of our year-long, or really semester-long series on incarnation. We'll switch to resurrection in the spring semester. Uh, I'm Brennan Breed, um, professor of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary. Um, so uh, uh, thanks so much for being here. I just I cannot believe that, that you all want to talk about incarnation uh, and read about the Enuma Elish, ancient Babylonian creation myths, on a Sunday morning. But in any event, just to catch you back up a little bit about where we were, uh, we're talking about incarnation, and usually Christians just jump right to Jesus uh, and the birth of Jesus and so on. We're going to take our time a few weeks uh, uh, before jumping to the New Testament, which we will get to. Uh, but we're going to talk about how um, people uh, in the community of ancient Israel, uh, how they understood the relationship between God and stuff. So basically the idea of incarnation, right? The, the idea that God is enfleshed somehow in the person of Jesus Christ in the Christian tradition uh, comes out of an older, uh, much older, um, in fact, uh, you know, ancient uh, understanding of, um, of how God relates to the world. So for most people today, if you kind of ask them, uh, well, you know, think about how God relates to the world, people will generally follow along the lines of what we call classical theism. Uh, there's a God out there who somehow creates the world. Um, God, there, here's a, a medieval sort of uh, uh, image from a Bible Morelise, a moralized Bible. Um, one of these beautiful illuminated uh, manuscripts. And here is God with a big compass kind of drawing the earth. So God kind of stands outside of the world beyond it. God could be imaged as a human being. Notice here that, that God is being imaged as Jesus because you can image God as Jesus in the Christian tradition, but imaging God as God is a little bit weirder. Um, of course, Michelangelo does it in the Sistine Chapel and so on, but mm -hmm. many Christians are a little bit reticent uh, to image God beyond Jesus. Um, that is, God before the time of Jesus or whatever, uh, in part because uh, God is not stuff. Um, God can't be pictured as a thing. Uh, so there's an idea in the Christian tradition, but also many other religious traditions, that God is transcendent. God stands above the world, beyond it. We are imminent things. We are like earthly bound creatures um, who somehow are trying to perceive uh, a God beyond. So as I said, this is classical theism, or the deists would, would kind of uh, follow this idea as well. Folks who say, well, God created the world and then kind of stepped away. That's another option, rather than God continue to be involved with the world that God had created. Well, today we're going to take a step back from that classical theist position, and we're going to uh, encounter the Bible. Uh, the Bible is not exactly a classical theist position document. Um, it's, not, it's not systematic or philosophical in the way that a lot of people today would try to think about how... Um, if you start thinking about how God relates to stuff, we would start with kind of philosophical categories. Uh, most of the folks who wrote the Bible um, were sort of not inured in Greek ways of thinking about how to categorize the universe. Um, and most of them had uh, an expectation that was really what we would call ancient Near Eastern, uh, or really part of the ancient world more generally. And that's the idea that there's lots of gods. Uh, people who wrote the Bible, a lot of them believe there are lots of gods too. Um, so we assume that ancient Israelites were monotheistic. Um, they became monotheistic over a long period of time. That is, they believed that there was one God, but they start out believing there's lots of gods and that their God is the most special of all those gods. Um, so in any event, we'll, we'll get to this in just a second. But most ancient Eastern people, including the folks who wrote the Bible, or at least wrote the Old Testament, uh, most of them believe that, uh, that the gods are a part of the world. Um, gods are made out of stuff just like people are made out of stuff. And we'll see this in just a moment. Um, but then also the gods are like really powerful and can shape and kind of create the world that humans know out of the stuff that the gods are also made out of. And that there's lots of gods and that they're also limited in many ways. And this is a polytheism, the idea there's lots of gods. Um, anthropotheism is a word that we'll see, uh, we'll encounter a lot today. That's like anthropomorphism, right? This idea that gods are, the theists, you know, the, the gods are shaped like humans, like anthropos. So, human-shaped gods, gods who have hands and feet and walk in the garden and so on, just like Genesis uh, 2 and 3. And then uh, there's another sort of uh, part of religious belief, animism, the idea that kind of gods inhabit certain things. And we'll actually see that in the ancient Near East, uh, this, there, there are some what we might call even animist beliefs in some ways. So ancient Israel is an ancient Near Eastern people. That is, they belong in the world of the ancient Near East. 
So uh, ancient Near East meaning sort of from Mesopotamia, really even ancient Persia, um, all the way to ancient Egypt. What we might think of as the Fertile Crescent, right? Um, that big swath of land where writing was invented, where the agricultural revolution first occurred and so on. Uh, ancient Israel comes onto the scene very late among these peoples. Um, so ancient Israel emerges as a polity, that is as like a you know, country or whatever, uh, right around the year 1000 BC. So ancient Sumer, like some of the cities in ancient Sumer are as old as maybe 4,500 or 5,000 BC. So when ancient Israel emerges on the scene, there's already a culture that's been around for 4,000 years. And ancient Israel even says itself that it emerges out of these different, out of different kind of nationalities. There's some Egyptian people or Egyptian kind of uh, um, people who identify with Egyptian culture like Moses who are part of ancient Israel. There's also people who identify with kind of more like ancient Syria. Um, when people talk about Jacob and, and, and in, uh, the, the creed really in Deuteronomy 25, uh, Jacob's called an Aramean, like a, a Syrian person. And then you have like Mesopotamian people like Abraham who are part of this culture. There's, so ancient Israel kind of points to all the peoples around them um, and says we, we kind of come from a lot of these different people. We, we emerge out of them as a people. So ancient Israelites believe a lot of the stuff that ancient Eastern people believe. They are an ancient Eastern people. Now, for me as a Christian, this doesn't bother me because I think that God speaks to people where they are. God speaks to the kinds of cultures that people exist in. God speaks in ways that regular people can understand. So uh, if God is going to speak to ancient Eastern people, God's going to speak to them in ways that ancient Eastern people would understand. This is why ancient Israel has animal sacrifice. It's something that every single ancient Eastern people have. Um, the Israelites believe something different about it than everybody else, but still, that, that's the world that they exist in. Ancient Israelites pray in ways that sound very familiar to us from other ancient Eastern peoples. And as we'll see today, they have creation myths that look a lot like the creation myths of the people around them. So the question isn't, do ancient Israelites do everything that's, do they have a religion that's totally different than the people around them? My answer is no, and that we shouldn't believe that that's the truth, because that's, that's the case, uh, simply because they would make no sense to them. <laughs> like, if you're trying to speak to ancient Eastern people, you have to speak in a way they understand. So God speaks to them through creation myths that makes sense to ancient Easterners. If we read Genesis 1 and we think of it as a science textbook or something like that, the ancient Israelites were ancient Easterners. They didn't have science textbooks. They didn't understand that genre. They didn't know anything about ancient science or modern science even. Even for their day, ancient Israelites were very behind in terms of what, what science was. Ancient Babylonians are pretty good at predicting eclipses and things like this. Ancient Israelites weren't. Um, so in any event, uh, ancient Israelites need to be spoken to in a way that they can understand. So uh, they, they're going to get ancient Eastern creation myths. They're going to get ancient Eastern hymns and liturgies and so on. And also, they're going to have preconceptions about God or the gods and how they work that fit with their culture and time. So how do gods work in the ancient Near East? Again, for 5,000 years, there's written, you know, whatever, for 3,000 years, there's written evidence, you know, sort of before ancient Israel uh, about what gods are and how they work. So ancient Israel knows all this stuff. The Epic of Gilgamesh has been around for 1,000 years before ancient Israel is a people. Um, uh, the Enuma Elish, the ancient Babylonian creation story, has been around for 1,000 years before Israel uh, emerges on the scene. Um, this is the kind of stuff that they know and expect um, when they hear the, about the gods. So this is a little uh, ancient Eastern image. Uh, this is a Mesopotamian image of a king uh, sort of receiving a parade of the gods. And you'll notice that the gods are riding on animals. Those are the totem animals. In the ancient Near East, there's a presupposition there's lots of gods. They form a pantheon, uh, sort of a family, really, of the gods. You can think of it as like an ancient, um, like an ancient family. Uh, there's, whenever you talk about the gods, you can hear how they're related to one another. So uh, there's a presupposition that there's like a, a couple, like a, a mom and dad god that make like all of the baby gods. You can, you can think about, if you're, if you're familiar with Greek uh, uh, myths, right, there's, there's kind of Kronos and some of the, the titans, whatever, some of the first generation of the gods, and they're kind of crazy and not great. And then they have baby gods, right? Zeus is part of the baby gods, and the baby gods are actually the good ones who kind of run the universe. Um, this is uh, familiar to a lot of ancient Easterners. The Greeks really kind of adapted a lot of their theology and, and mythology from ancient Eastern sources, like this, they stole from the ancient Mesopotamians. Um, but so, uh, so this is actually really familiar to, to ancient Easterners. Uh, there's some, there some mom and dad gods that are kind of like distant and kind of in the past, ancient past, and they have baby gods, and those baby gods end up creating the world that we know and running it. So they're in this like, kind of family, and different gods play different roles in that family. There's a storm god in most of these ancient Eastern societies. 
Um, there's a kind of god of um, uh, the rivers or the deep. There's a god of wisdom or a goddess of wisdom, a god of justice. There's a god who kind of plays the role of the sun. Um, so there's different kind of gods that play different roles. And in the ancient Near East, in your pantheon, you could kind of look at other pantheons around you, that is, other peoples that were nearby, and say, like, you've got a storm god. I've got a storm god. They're, our storm gods are kind of similar. They, I, we can call them the same name even. So there's a translation that can happen between these pantheons, and oftentimes did happen whenever people talk to each other about their gods. Brandon, when you said God that plays the role of the sun, is that the sun in the sky? Or the sun yeah, the, the sky? actual sun in the sky. So, you know, like a, uh, uh, in ancient uh, Mesopotamia, Shemesh or Shamash was the, the sun god. And he was also the one who kind of gave the authority to the king to give laws. If you've ever seen Hammurabi's Stella, that's Hammurabi's code, the big, the big piece of rock that Hammurabi's code is written on. Shamash, the sun god, is the one who's handing Hammurabi a big stick and a big piece of cord uh, to measure stuff, to, you know, to be just, to, to make good laws and so on. So, in any event, uh, there were a lot of presuppositions about what, kind of, what, what gods could do. Okay, so we think about God, generally, North Americans and so on, as like a transcendent, omniscient, omnipotent, God knows everything, God can do everything and so on. In the ancient Near East, this is just not the presupposition. Um, the presupposition is that gods are really, really strong and powerful. There is a presupposition that they look like humans. They're not beyond human form. Um, they're, anthropo po they're anthropomorphic or anthropotheic, right? You know, like the gods are in the human, human shape. Or really, humans are made in God's shape in the ancient Near East. Um, the other presupposition is that uh, they, they have passions. They, they have, like, they, they, they get mad. They make mistakes. Like they're, like, they're like big, strong people who are really smart, smarter than any person, bigger than any person, but they can get things wrong, they can be tricked. Just think of any story that you know about Zeus and Hera and so on. I mean, these, these ancient gods can be tricked and they can, they can make mistakes. They can uh, uh, even have uh, sort of bad morals or ethics. They can get in trouble for hubris and things like this uh, in ancient Greek myths and in ancient Eastern myths. Um, but the idea is that Overall, the gods who run the world have an idea of justice. There's a, they want things to be good, but you, they might fight with each other, and you might have to kind of uh, side with one over the other in some ways, too. Um, so here's a, a king. The king would be the one in the society who would actually like kind of relate to the high gods. Um, you as a commoner, we're all commoners in this room, right? Anyone have any titles? You know, okay, so we're not nobility or aristocracy. If you are nobility or aristocracy, you would have been able to talk to the high gods. If you're like me and you're not, you're just not really special, uh, then you, you would absolutely not have had any right to talk to the high gods. Your king would have done that for you and the high priests who were associated with the king. The temples in the main cities were places where these main gods would have lived. And the temples were their homes. They sort of lived there in a way. So uh, again, this, uh, just to give you a sense of these, um, where these gods, they're related kind of by birth and, and, and marriage. Uh, here's Anu, the high sky god, who marries Antu and has uh, kids like Enki and so on. And then underneath, these are ancient Mesopotamian gods and their family relationships. Um, you may have heard of some of these, like Enlil um, and so on. But they're associated with certain cities. Nippur, a city where during the exile, a lot of ancient Israelites were settled, or ancient Judaites were settled. Um, uh, for example, Ezekiel. Uh, wrote his book in Nippur, this Mesopotamian city when he was in exile. Uh, and the god of that city is Enlil. So there would have been a big temple for Enlil. And in that temple, a big statue, a cult statue. Ancient Israelites saw this and they said, those are idols. They think those things are alive. They think they're gods. Well, ancient Easterners didn't think they were gods. They made a cult statue as like a place where the god could manifest in a way. Because they believed the gods looked like humans, really. But also they believed that they could be invisible. And they believed that they could fly. And they believed that they could like become, they could manifest in certain things. Uh, there seems to have been a belief that they could have manifest in the thing they were associated with. So Dagon, the major god of wheat um, in the ancient Near East, um, could be like in the wheat that you have in the field. Wheat was called Dagon. The god was called Dagon. This, so, that, so the god could be present in the natural world. That's why I said it could be almost understood a little bit like animist uh, religions. Um, the god could be in the stuff. The god could be kind of present invisibly. By the way, the Ark of the Covenant in, the, in ancient Israel, you've heard of the Ark of the Covenant, right? Indiana Jones and so on. That's a portable throne. The idea was that Yahweh, the God of Israel, sat on that throne invisibly, and they marched around with it. It was a portable throne. So no one saw Yahweh on top of it, but they thought that the gods could manifest invisibly. We know this from inscriptions in the ancient Near East, too. The ancient Phoenicians have thrones, and they would say the goddess is manifest invisibly on top of this throne. Um, so that's just how the gods work. So uh, in their, in, they're associated with major cities, but you understand that, that people would have understood them to be kind of like hang out on maybe mountaintops together or in the sky somewhere together. Like there's a place where these gods that kind of hang out, 
but they could also be in your city, and they could also be invisibly with your armies, and they could also be in things like wheat or water. Now, for us, modern Western folks, uh, we tend to think in categories um, like uh, non-coincidence. Uh, we tend to think that there's, there's a, a property of non-coincidence. Um, I can't be here and outside at the same time. There's only one of me. Ancient Near Easterners don't have a logical problem with non-coincidence, uh, it seems. That they might have a problem if I say I'm here and outside at the same time, but also they tend to think of the, that the world works a little bit differently than we do. Um, they think that the, there can be people in two places at once, but they also think that because they think that you are not confined to your physical body. The people as well as gods. Uh, they think that, have you ever heard of, like, you ever read the Bible and you come across something about the name? Like, I'm going to make your name great, or I'm going to curse your name, and people take that really seriously? Um, that's because people thought your name was a part of you, a real part of you, just like your hand is a part of you. And if someone says your name, that's you in their mouth. Like, you are on their lips, you are on their mind, whatever. Your name, your, your reputation, what people say about you, is really important, and it's a real part of you. Also, your image. Your image was a really important part of who you were. So if they, someone made a picture of you today, like if I take a photograph of you and then I burn it in front of you, you might be like, that's a really weird thing to do. It's very strange. It's awkward. I'm unhappy you're doing that. But you wouldn't imagine that it actually hurt you as a person. In the ancient Near East, there was an assumption that your image was an extension of yourself, your real self, your body. So if someone burns your image, you don't feel pain, but they are hurting a real part of you. This is why in the ancient Near East you'll see images that are kind of hacked, the faces are hacked out from kings that had been destroyed or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> the idea wasn't just that they were like erasing the king's image or name, they were really taking away some of that king's power. So the image of something is an extension of that thing's being. Does that make sense? So the image of the god, if you do it, make it the right way, you make ritual incantations over it and so on, it becomes a real thing. I have a great story about this that has to do with eclipses. Did I already tell you about the eclipse, the, the story of the eclipses and the Syrian kings, maybe last year? Okay, but if you never heard this, it's pretty cool. So we just had an eclipse. Babylonians were great at predicting eclipses because they thought it was a really bad sign. They thought the gods were blotting out the sun in order to say something bad was gonna happen, usually to the king. So the king is kind of like the light to the, to the, the, the nation and so on. If they, you're blotting out the light in the sky, it's a bad sign about the king. Okay, so ancient Mesopotamians could predict these things they knew it was coming, but also they still thought that it was like not a regular, they thought that, well, the, the gods are actually mad at the king. So they came up with an idea. They said, okay, king, we don't want to kill you. We don't want you to die, but the, the gods are mad at you. So here's what we'll do. We'll make an image of you. We'll take a person, we'll just take like a gardener, and we'll put, dress them in your clothes. We'll have a ritual incantation over them. We'll call them by your name. We'll say that they're the king, and then we'll just execute them. So to get the omen out of the way, and, and then we'll, you, you'll come back as the real king. Does that, does that sound good? And the king says, great. So the king goes into hiding for a couple of days and just kind of hangs out by himself, and they make this fake king, and they have this fake king marry a fake queen, and that person actually rules for a couple of days, lives a nice life, wears nice clothes, eats good food, and then the day of the eclipse comes, and they die. <laughs> One day, not kidding, this actually happened in, in ancient Mesopotamia. One day, this is a Neo-Syrian king uh, who is uh, uh, in, you know, in his little chamber during an eclipse, and he's eating hot soup. Now, the record, the chronicle says, the Babylonian chronicle says, uh, that this guy ate soup that was so hot that it, he died. He might have been poisoned. But the gardener who had been made king just was the king. <laughs> and that guy lived until he was 90-something, <laughs> just being the king. And the, the, and the peasant woman they, they picked to be his queen, she just was the queen. Just until the day they died. Right? Uh, that, because that person had been made the image of the king. You're the image of the king, you're the king. The king has two bodies walking around the, the house, that's fine, that's, who cares? That does not, that's, so it's not a problem. The same way with gods. There's two or three bodies of the god walking around, that's fine, that's okay, it's not, a, not an issue. Sometimes there's even like different shrines to the same god in different towns. They would just say, well, that's the shrine to Inanna of uh, uh, whatever, Eridu, and this is, you know, that they would actually have different, different well, the, that, that's the god of there, and that's the god of here, and it's the same god. There's two versions of that god, that's fine. It's almost like Mary of Lourdes and uh, um, Mary of Guadalupe. Like, you know, there's different versions of Mary in a way. That's the way it works in the ancient world as well, with all of these gods. So, uh, in any event, they're associated with cities, but they don't, they aren't, they aren't like limited to that city. Um, in any event, it's, it's, it's hard for us to understand, but nonetheless, this is the way they think about, about gods. But also that the gods are, are made from stuff, the same stuff of the world that you're made out of. The gods are just made from like a supercharged version of it. Um, and the gods are able to do lots of stuff that you can't do. And also the gods don't die, um, they live, but they can be killed. 
So the gods don't get old and die like we do. Uh, the gods don't just fall apart. Their bodies can continue in perpetuity, but they can also be killed. The gods can fight each other when one god can die. When they die, they can sometimes pop back to life. Um, sometimes just because like the, the people who tell the, the myths and stories like kind of get tired of like not having a bad guy, so the bad guy comes back to life. Um, but also sometimes because it's understood that the gods can just kind of pop back into existence. Like I said, the gods tend to live in temples. This is a, in a sort of artist recreation of the um, of the temple in Jerusalem, but this would have looked a lot like other um, temples from the from the region at the time. You would have had like little shrines. Here's a little shrine. The image of a god would have been sort of in that shrine. You can have local shrines, but also personal shrines. Here's a an altar, a four horned altar, an ancient Eastern style altar from uh, Beersheba. So you would have like look, household shrines, local shrines, major sort of national shrines. And the same gods could be involved in all of these, but if you were had a, like a local, like a household shrine, you probably have like a, a low, lower class god that would be a part of your family's life. So the gods are not just organized to a family, they're organized into classes. There's the high gods, the major gods, that would have hung out in the major cities and the major temples, and they would have hung out with the priests and the kings and so on. Um, then there would have been the middle class gods, the kind of craftsman gods, right? And they would have maybe been associated with like craftsman clans or uh, different like uh, kind of trades, trades groups, um, like the merchants groups or people who make stuff, make weapons and things like that would have had their own maybe like god. There was like a middle class god. And then there's the lower class gods, the gods of the families. Uh, so like, you know, me, I don't know anyone special, uh, so I get a lower class god. Like, you know, no, no high god has time to talk to me, right? They're, they're powerful, but they have limited time and limited attention. So I have to like make friends with the lower class god and then have that lower class god hang out like with the higher class gods and, and kind of like maybe like put in a good word for me. Uh, so that's how, uh, uh, that's how sort of the, the, the system works. And how do I get those lower class gods to like me? I feed them. Gods need food, just like people need food. Well, what's the temple for? What do you do inside the temple? You sacrifice. You sacrifice, right? You, you, you take food and you sacrifice it and you cook it. You burn it on the altar. You cook meat. It's a, it's a barbecue pit. Like this is a big barbecue pit. You just, you're, the, the reason that they're doing this is two reasons. Number one, you use the blood of animals and you ritually manipulate it. You put it on the horns of the altar and that's understood to be efficacious for in some, some ways a human sin. Uh, in ancient Israel. In other, in ancient, other ancient Eastern societies, they don't really have that same problem. Um, they tend to think that like, putting the blood of, of, of animals on, on stuff purifies it uh, from like, de demonic powers. In ancient Eastern cultures, generally, they don't think that humans are the demons. Um, in ancient Israel, they think humans are the problem with the world. So in any event, uh, human sin is the problem in ancient Israel. But they, they'll, 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 it's a book of Leviticus. It goes into great detail about all this. Um, but so when, when, when you cook that food, though, you're cooking it for the gods. And then the understanding is like it kind of goes up to heaven and the gods eat the smoke part. They like that. Um, and then, then like they, you know, whatever's left over, the cooked nice meat part, the priests get to eat. Uh, in the Bible, you'll see that it, there's sometimes where it's like there's a pleasing odor or a pleasing aroma to God. I think that's the gods, you know, like that. Well, they like that smell. Uh, that's the way ancient Easterners think. Okay, so where do you do this cooking? You do it in the temple because that's the house of the God. That's the God's actual home. The God has like a, like a literal physical home. Does that make sense? So uh, the, the, the Holy of Holies in ancient Israel, right? Every culture has a Holy of Holies. Um, that's not just ancient Israel. The Holy of Holies is the place where the cult statue would have been, is where the, the, it's the bedroom of the God. So this would have been like the God's courtyard, the, the God's yard. And then like this is like the God's house. And inside the God's house, there's like a nice room where you can like have a table in ancient Israel of showbread, you know, like a hospitality table. You know, you have a nice place when people come in to sit. <clears throat> and then you have your bedroom. You don't invite everyone into your bedroom all the time, right? So uh, the, the, the Holy of Holies was a more, you know, kind of closed off space and so on. Um, so this is an understanding that the gods actually in some way dwell there, or at least partially dwell there. Um, <clears throat> ancient Canaanites, people who live in the region that became ancient Israel, um, they believed in a pantheon of gods, including Ale, the high god, who we'll hear more about next week, um, and Baal, the storm god. Um, you've heard about Baal maybe from your Bible stories about the priests of Baal and so on, uh, the prophets of Baal. Um, those, the, that's part of this kind of larger um, ancient Near Eastern uh, culture of a pantheon of gods, including their high, this is a high god, Ale. And this is a little stella or, or drawing on a piece of rock um, of Baal. And you can see here, this is Baal the storm god, and he's got a big spear that he can throw out of the sky. And what is that spear? It's both lightning and plants. Like it brings, you know, the, the storms bring lightning and thunder, but they also bring the growth of plants. And here's a little, like, god carrying some weapons for Baal. Like, like got Baal's little side god, um, little, little squire, I guess. Um, and Baal's got a sword here and a big mace, a club up there. You know, Baal can, like, hurt people. So this is Baal the storm god. And 
uh, this is kind of the pattern. Like this is one way that ancient Israelites understood Yahweh was as a storm god who came with thunder and lightning and hurt Israel's enemies on Israel's behalf to protect Israel. Like this is the storm god imagery is huge and ancient. So we'll get to this again uh, next week when we talk about um, where does Yahweh come from. Uh, so today we'll talk more about uh, the, the creation myths, but the next week we'll talk about um, the, the question even in the Bible of kind of what, who is Yahweh and where does Yahweh come from. Okay, just to give you a sense of like what people think about these temples, here's Indara, a temple in uh, modern day Syria. This would have been an ancient um, uh, 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 Syrian sort of, uh, the people of Damascus, whatever, that would have seen this as kind of their, their cultural territory. Um, so this is uh, part of the temple. Here's the, 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 the courtyard outside. Here's the interior, and then the kind of holy, holy area would have been up here in the center. And right outside of it, right here, on the, on the, um, it's kind of the threshold of the temple, there are giant footprints from the Iron Age. This is from the time when ancient Israel was a country, was a nation and so on. So, uh, so here are these, there are three of them. There's two here and then one here, almost like it's like the God is stepping into the temple. And you can see the size of them. They're much bigger than any person's foot, right? So the idea is that this is showing you that the gods are giant. This is why the scale of stuff, um, the scale of the temples is giant. It's just a, a giant's house, right? But also there's an idea that you can even see here that like, you can't always see the gods. You have to have kind of like an impression of the foot so that you can know that the god was there and also how big the god is and so on. Are those sand? Are those impressions in sand or in rock? They're, they're carved into the rock. Yeah, they're like even relief, uh, bas relief, so they're carved into the rock. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so just to give you a sense of how gods relate to stuff in the ancient world, a particular example, I'm going to read to you a little bit of the Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish, uh, that's, these, these are, this is ancient Babylonian. Um, Enuma, Elish, the, that phrase means uh, I went on high or like, you know, basically in the beginning. Um, it's, their, it's their creation story uh, that probably was read once a year at their Akitu festival, uh, read out loud to all the people of Babylon who would gather and hear during the New Year's festival about the creation of the world. So the idea was on the New Year, there's the recreation of the world. The world is like done again. And they would have this big procession around town. They would carry the statue of Marduk, the major god of Babylon. And you'll hear about why they would do this with him in a second. Uh, and it was written, maybe, I don't know, maybe around 1800 BC, like sometime around Hammurabi, um, probably. Well, we're not exactly sure. Could have been later or earlier than that. But uh, we have these kind of seven tablets. Um, they called the seven tablets of creation um, that would have had the story. Okay, so in ancient Israelites would have known this story. They would have, they would have like the, the, the scribes who wrote the parts of the Bible that we have were highly educated people. This would have been a very famous story in the ancient Near East. So famous that we have examples of other ancient Near Eastern peoples, including the Assyrians, taking this story, taking out the Babylonian god, putting their own local god in as the high god, and the kind of like making their own version of this story. And Genesis 1, as we'll see in a moment, plays on this story too. So again, the ancient Israelites are reacting to and talking to the cultures that are around them, including themselves, um, who are ancient Near Eastern. And they're using some of these ancient Near Eastern ideas about creation to express, I think, a theology of creation. So here's the beginning of this story. If you can't see it, I'll read it to you. When the heavens above, that's Anuma Elish, like when above, when on high, when the heavens above didn't exist and the earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu the first in order, the begetter. That's the sky god, or, the, or the, really the god of, I'm sorry, not the sky god, that's Anu. Uh, Apsu is the god of the deep, uh, the god of the fresh water deep. Apsu, the first in order, their begetter. And the demiurge, Tiamat, uh, that's the goddess of the, the salt water. So we have the god of the fresh water and the god of the salt water, these two man and female and female kind of gods. Again, the gods have kind of genders in the ancient Near East, understood to be patterned on their understandings of human gender. So there's Apsu and Tiamat, who are kind of like these primordial water things, but also male and female, and kind of married, and they give birth to them all. They're the ones who gave birth to all of the main gods, Apsu and Tiamat. They had mingled their waters together in the brackish waters of southern Iraq, where this, this idea came together, uh, before Meadowland had coalesced and rebed, when not one of the gods had been formed or had come into being, when no destinies had been decreed, the gods were created within them. This sounds a lot like Kronos, right? Uh, and the Zeus and all the, you know, Kronos like ate Zeus and you know. Uh, so like ancient Greek myths sound a lot like this too. Lachmu and Lachmu were formed and came into being while they grew and increased in stature. Anshar and Kishar, these are just other gods who excelled them were created. They prolonged their days, they multiplied their years. These are almost like the Titans. Um, these are kind of like proto-gods. Um, so again, Apsu and Tiamat are two water-based deities who get together and have the progeny of the universe. So they, the gods are made out of water stuff. This just the stuff. There, there was stuff. 
and this kind of stuff made the world. This is ancient Egyptians think this, Newt and Geb, Newt the sky goddess, and Geb the earth god, procreate and create all of the gods. Um, in uh, uh, ancient uh, Mesopotamia, they, I mean in ancient um, uh, uh, Greece, they have these, these ideas. So these are kind of just general ancient Near Eastern ideas. Apsu, the god of the freshwater deep, opened his mouth and told Tiamat their behavior, that is these young gods, who like run around and like, you know, play their music loud and stay up night, late, yeah, late at night. Um, they, they're making Apsu and Tiamat real mad because they're making noise. Their behavior has become displeasing to me and I cannot rest in the daytime or sleep at night. Mm -hmm. These water gods like to sleep all the time. I will destroy and break up their way of life. That silence may reign and we may sleep. Every parent says, Amen. <laughs> um, every parent has ever has, has felt this. Ancient Easterners did too. Uh, when Tiamat heard this, she raged and cried out to her spouse. She cried in distress, fuming within herself. She grieved over the evil. Okay, so Apsu says, let's kill all these kids. Tiamat says, they're my kids. I don't want to kill them. How can we destroy what we've given birth to? Though their behavior causes distress, let us tighten discipline graciously. <laughs> this is, Catherine and I have had this exact same conversation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what happens is that Tiamat kind of like lets the secret out, right, that Apsu's thinking about killing all of the kids. And Ea, otherwise known as Enki, Ea in the Sumerian tradition, Enki in the Babylonian tradition, he's called Ea in this story. But he's a god of great wisdom who kind of comes from the deep himself. Uh, so he's the one who's like the progenitor of, of, of wisdom traditions and of scribes, of, of wise men in the ancient Near East and women in the ancient Near East. Um, but so Enki, here he is kind of coming out of the deeps. So there's like water and like fish kind of coming out of him. Uh, uh, here he is living uh, in his like deep abode. Um, so Ea the god. So he ends up hearing about this from Tiamat. He says, okay, I got a plan. Let's kill Apsu while he's sleeping. So let's all be quiet one night. Let him get his sleep that he wants so bad. And then off him. So that he doesn't kill all of us, right? So Enki does what he, what he plans. Uh, meanwhile, Tiamat gets really mad at this. Because that's her husband who just got whacked by her kids, right? So she says, I didn't want him to kill you, but I didn't want you to kill him either. So Tiamat gets real mad and she puts together an army. She gathered her creation and organized battle against the gods, her offspring. Henceforth, Tiamat plotted evil because of Apsu, like, you know, on behalf of, you know, in protection of Apsu. Okay, so now there's a fight among the gods. Okay, as the gods begin to fight, uh, Tiamat picks this one god, Kingu, and makes him, like, the chief general of her armies, and gives him what's called the Tablets of Destiny, the things that, if you, if you have them, you kind of are, like, the high god who gets to control stuff, control the destiny of the world. You get to write the destiny of the world onto the tablets. So, Kingu is in charge of stuff. Well. There's this kind of low god, I mean, not low class, but like a, one of the younger gods, not very well respected and so on, but the god of the city Babylon, his name is Marduk. Marduk says, I tell you what, I got a plan. How about you let me fight Tiamat and I'll just beat her. And everyone says, ha, 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 ha. And Marduk says, oh, I'll, go, I'll go and do it. So here's an image uh, from, from Neo-Syria showing this story. And here's Tiamat. Uh, this kind of chaotic, watery monster. Uh, and here's Marduk, the god of Babylon, who ends up destroying Tiamat, saving all of creation, or saving all of the, 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 you know, the, the other gods, um, and becoming the high god in the process, the high god of the whole earth. So this is the story of Babylon becoming ascendant. This is Babylon narrating how they became the, the highest city, the biggest city in the world. Under the reign of Hammurabi, they had recently become the biggest, most important city in what they knew as, as the world. Here's another image from a cylinder seal, what they used to sign documents. Um, they would, everyone would have their own picture that was just their own picture. So when you had a document you want to sign, you'd roll out your, your image. This is someone's image of Marduk on his totem animal. Um, and we'll get to totem animals next week as well, by the way. This is why I like the whole bowl thing with like the, the golden calf. That wasn't, that's not a calf. That's the totem animal for a god. And that god is Yahweh, by the way. So, anyway, we'll get to that. We'll read Exodus 32 next week. Um, so, here's, here's Marduk on top of his totem animal fighting Tiamat, the deep monster, right? You know? So, uh, he wins, and Bel, which is Lord, he's now called, after that, he's called Lord, right? So, Bel rested, and he surveyed the corpse of Tiamat, right? The, and then, in order to divide the lump by a clever scheme, he sees the body of Tiamat, and he says, I can do something with this. He split her in two like a dried fish. One half of her he set up and stretched out as the heavens. Do you see what he's doing? He makes the world out of the corpse of Tiamat. He crossed over the heavens, surveyed the celestial parts, and adjusted them to match the Apsu. So there's the Apsu beneath, and there's Tiamat above, like Newt and Geb in uh, Egyptian tradition. 
Bell measured the shape of the Apsu and he set up a Shara, a replica of Eshgala, that's a, the temple. He built himself a nice house to live in. In Eshgala, a Shara which he had built in the heavens, he settled their shrines, Anu, Enlil, and Ea. The main gods, Anu, Enlil, and Ea, he built them homes too. In these major, what become major cities of ancient Mesopotamia. This is an origin story for the people of Mesopotamia, why they live where they live, why they worship the gods that they worship, how order has been structured, and why Babylon needs to stay on top, right? You know, because it's like the gods have decreed that like we need to be in charge. Um, so that is I mean, where the world comes from. It's made out of God's body, one of the God's bodies. Where do people come from? Well, this is a little bit later in the story. Uh, Marduk or Bell has now cre you know, created order within the universe and the gods are pretty happy with that, but also the gods say, can you do some of them more for us now that you're in charge? We're tired of working because the gods need to work for themselves. They need to make their own clothes, they need to make their own house, they need to keep, you know, you know Marduk just built houses for all of his friends. Like, we're kind of tired of this. Like, can we get some help? So Kingu, remember that god that was the major general god of Tiamat? He needs to be punished for his rebellion. Kingu is the one who instigated warfare, who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion. This is what Marduk says. King who's the bad guy. They bound him. They held him before Ea, that god of wisdom. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. They kill, they, they kill him. From his blood, Ea, the god of wisdom, created mankind, mm -hmm. on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. Humans are made out of the blood of a god that's been poured into the ground and like made into this little like. So humans are like half god, half earth creatures, but earth is like the body of a god anyway, right? So what are humans made to do in this story, by the way? Work. Work. We serve the gods. That's why we were made. We are slaves to the gods. Gods got tired of doing work, so they made humans, and the temples are the place where you bring your grain every year. Why do you give up like a third of all of the stuff that you make as a subsistence farmer every year? Because you're feeding the gods in their temple. So that's why, that's why you do what you do. Make sense? Okay, so that, this, is, this is also not just a story about how Babylon becomes transcendent, but also it's a story for all of you about why you participate in the order and keep things stable, right? And why you bring all of your grain to the temple and watch it get burned and then watch the priest eat it, right? Um, so anyway, uh, but this, this here is another image of kind of uh, Marduk probably laying out Tiamat's body to be used like as the sky and things like that, right? So this was a, a hugely important uh, myth in the ancient Near East. And the ancient Israelites knew this for sure. How do we know they knew this? Well, uh, they had access to Mesopotamian stories. We, we have copies of Gilgamesh and other ancient Eastern literature um, uh, in, in ancient Israel. I mean, just the, the people had access to this kind of stuff, but also because ancient uh, uh, Israelites had to talk to Babylon. They had, they, they had to go there and conduct uh, alliance, you know, treaty uh, uh, negotiations and so on, but also they ended up in exile there. Um, while in exile there, they certainly heard this story over and over again and enacted and been pronounced. And the whole point of it was to tell everyone, all of the people who had been conquered by Babylon, you better get with this order because the gods have decreed it. Okay, so with that in, line, in mind, pick up your Bibles and let's open to Genesis 1. Now, Whenever we talk about creation in the Bible, we'll always start with Genesis 1, but at the same time, it's important to notice that there's, this is not the only creation story in the Bible. Uh, in fact, just in the Old Testament, there's at least seven different creation stories. If we have time, I'll read you a couple of them and so you can see how different they are. There isn't just one overarching creation story for ancient Israel. Again, they have several, and they are all different in a way. The point wasn't to give us a textbook, a science textbook, or a historical understanding of what exactly happened. The point was to give us a theology of creation that told us about the order of the world, that told us about us humans, where we come from, why we are like we are, what the problem is in the world, and what, 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 what the gods want us, or God, what God wants us to do about it. Okay, so Genesis 1. In the beginning... When God created the heavens and the earth, you might have a different translation there. Um, but you can see, remember, when on high the earth was not yet created, that's the beginning of the ancient Near Eastern Babylonian creation myth. This is the beginning of, a, this is how you start a creation story. Just like I say, once upon a time, I'm starting a fairy tale. If I say, dear madam or sir, I'm starting a form letter. That's a, a stock piece of speech that you understand. It tips you off. In the beginning, or when the gods began to create the world, when God began to the act of creation and so on, um, when God created the heavens and the earth. This is, it sounds like the Numa Elish because the, the ancient Israelites are giving you, they're telling you what kind of story that they're telling, a creation story. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void 
and darkness covered the face of the deep. You hear anything there? What was there when God started the act of creation? Water. Water. This is ancient Easterners believe this. The, the world comes from a giant, undifferentiated mass of water. We saw that in the Numa Elish. This is in every ancient Eastern creation myth. Um, the ancient Canaanites have a creation myth that we can read about in the story of Baal, uh, the Baal cycle. There's actually, we've dug up out of the ground a Baal cycle, the story of Baal. We know what it was. Um, and it starts with uh, the Yom, the sea. And the Yom is a monster that tries to like, devour the other children of, of the gods. And Baal is the high god who fights the Yom and creates the earth out of the Yom, out of the sea. So in any event, this is normal, typical, ancient Eastern creation stuff. The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. And there was a wind, a wind from God, that slept, swept over the face of the waters. So we see that there's a slight difference here. Uh, the ancient Eastern creation stories start with like the gods procreating and creating like junior gods. We've only got one god here. The deep is not anthropomorphized as a, as a, a live deity. It's kind of inert matter. It's just there. And there's... God's spirit that's kind of beginning to act on the world. It's a slightly different way of thinking about how things work. Also, as this story progresses, you'll see there's no fight. All in the ancient Eastern creation stories that we have access to today begin with a major fight between chaos monsters and, and, and a, a deity, or the, or the deities. But we, there's no chaos monster here. It's just the world exists. Uh, the stuff exists. There's just a big dark. By the way, there's a creation uh, idea in uh, Christian history called creatio ex nihilo. God creates everything out of nothing. Genesis doesn't say that that's not true. It just doesn't tell us about that. <laughs> it just says it's starting the creation story with a bunch of stuff. It's just stuff that doesn't have anything happening to it. Undifferentiated stuff. Uh, so verse 3. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. There was evening, there was morning the first day. You can already see how different this is than the creation stories of the Enuma Elish. Uh, this is, God just says stuff and then it just happens. God is first creating order within this kind of undifferentiated mass of stuff. And the creation of light comes first. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters. This word rakia just means bowl. So uh, the way that ancient uh, Israelites think about it, um, there's water, there's just water everywhere. So what would you do if there's just water everywhere and you wanted to create a space that wasn't water? You'd take a bowl and you'd sink it upside down and create an air bubble. So the earth is an air bubble. Like we live in an air bubble and there's waters above us, which makes sense because when you look up, what do you see? Blue sky, it looks like water's above, right? In the Noah story, what does God do? God pokes holes in the bowl, in the firmament. Firmament, bowl, it's just bowl. <clears throat> God put an upside down bowl, God pokes holes in it in the Noah story and the waters above flood in. And then God pokes, plugs up the holes and drains out the bottom, right? And then they can get the air bubble again. So the earth is an air bubble in the midst of, uh, uh, in the, midst of the, the watery cosmos. So let it separate the waters from the waters. There's waters above, there's waters below now. Um, God creates a space. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. There was evening, there was morning the second day. So we're getting these kind of like <clears throat> got progressive like days. God's you know they got the kind of week mapped on here. That's not true in ancient Eastern mythology that we see. Um, this is kind of more orderly in a way. And God said, <clears throat> and by the way, just think about this. You've got light and dark now. You have kind of like a <coughs> kind of a separation between day and night or something like that. Um, and now you have a separation between kind of inhabitable airspace and water space. And then God says, let the waters under the sky, that is the water, there's still some water in the bowl, you need it. Uh, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. So in other words, organize some dry land out of this stuff. And it was so, God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called the seas. God saw it was good. And then God says, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit and the seed in it. And it was so, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. Now, just think about this from an ancient Eastern perspective. What is wheat? Wheat. It's a plant, but also it's a manifestation of the god Dagon, right? The wheat god, right? I mean, the, why do you pray to Dagon? Why do you sacrifice to Dagon? To get the wheat to grow. Why do you think an ancient Israelite is writing this? God makes the plants, and God says, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. Good night. That's like a lot of words about seeds in Genesis 1. 
If you were writing a history of the creation of the earth, you might not spend so much time talking about the seeds. Um, but why is God talking about the, there's seeds in the fruit? God made the earth with the stuff that the earth needs to continue in the earth. There's no need to worry about Dagon or Baal, the storm god. The earth works. God set up an order that just works. So appreciate God and just work with the earth, earth that you got. So in other words, it's, a, it's pushing back against a lot of these ancient agreements. Also, the, the, the body of the God is not the earth and so on. You know, There was no fight that had to happen. God just decided, let me make some good stuff for these people. And notice the way that the, this is even organized. Day one, you get the separation of light from darkness. Day two, you get the creation of kind of a space, and air bubble. Day three, you get the kind of like the, the waters get pulled away. You get spaces, the formation of safe and good spaces for things to inhabit. And then you get the creation of the stuff to inhabit the spaces, the stuff that inhabit the, the seeds that inhabit the space of the ground. And then verse 14, the next day, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from night. Now you get the, the lights up there, the sun and the moon and the stars. You get the stuff that inhabits the space that God already created on day one. And let them be lights. And so on. let them be signs and seasons for days and years. Let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light to the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. And the stars, God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. So there's a lot of stuff about stars and skies and whatever. But why do you think they go into this great depth? What are the sun and the moon and the stars to ancient Mesopotamian people? They're the gods. They're manifestations of the gods, right? And they also, they go around the, the, the eclipse. I told you about the eclipse, right? What is the eclipse? So it shows the portents of what the gods want. They're the tablets of destinies. They're just describes to you through the movement of the stars and so on. What are these here for? Just to give you light. They're just lights. And by the way, the word sun, I already told you what the name of the ancient Mesopotamian sun god's name was, Shamash. The word for sun in Hebrew is Shemesh. I mean, it's just the sun, right? But it's also the sun god's name. Guess what they don't use here? Shemesh. You don't see sun anywhere in here. They don't even want to say that word. They just call it the big light. <laughs> Why do they call it the big light? So that you don't think it's Shamash, right? These things aren't gods. They're just big lights in the sky to help you find your way around because it's good to have light and it's also good sometimes to have darkness. So they have this kind of little bit of light in the nighttime for you to find your way around. But also they're there to mark the seasons. Why do you need those seasons? So you know when to plant, you know the agricultural stuff also, so you know when to like do your rituals. So you know when Passover comes. So you know, you know, it's to mark days and times and so on. Not so that you have to get worried and kill your king because like there's an eclipse, but just so that you can like know when to pray on the right day, right? Um, so and it marked the Sabbath and stuff like that. So in any event, this is uh, it's it's a it's a pushing back against this ancient or eastern uh, motif uh, that you find in creation. Um, so then, uh, verse twenty, you see the next day, let, uh, God said, "Let waters bring forth swarms of living creatures." Again, the spaces that God has created. Now they're inhabited with all this stuff. And in verse 21, even God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves. So the sea monsters are not pre-existent things that God has to fight and kill and destroy. And by the way, Leviathan, you've heard of that, right? The name of the ancient sea monster in ancient Canaanite religion was Leviathan, Leviathan, right? The sea monster, right? It's a thing that pre-exists uh, ancient Israelite religion. They're working with these ideas that, they, that they're inheriting from the peoples around them, uh, and the Leviathan sea monster is one of them. Except God doesn't have to smash it to bits because, and to start the world. Um, chaos exists within the world because God lets it exist. This is the story of Job as well, the book of Job. The ending of Job, God gives a big speech about Leviathan, and God says, I made Leviathan. I don't have to kill Leviathan to start the world. I made a world where chaos exists so that new things can happen, but that also means that chaos can destroy. This is the world that God has made. <coughs> chaos isn't the result of a monster that God can't control. Chaos is the result of a world that God has created so that new things might happen, but also things might destroy, be destroyed. Yeah? Um, is there anything before, in between uh, the creation myths of the, all the uh, gods fighting mm -hmm. each other and then to this one, this god, and there are, there's not. You're noticing, chaos. good, there's no pantheon here, right? Yeah, like where's the other gods? Yeah, what happens? Yes, and so, how right. Did they, how did they, how get, how they get the there? Israelites? So that's next week. Okay. Next week, I'm going to, yeah, <laughs> next Sunday, yeah. Next Sunday, I'm going to answer the question how does ancient Israel start? With a, and they do start, by the way, ancient Israel starts the polytheistic understanding. Yahweh is the, what they say the most important of the gods, the one we have been given to worship, but they admit there are other gods out there. 
over time, and Genesis 1, we think, is actually a fairly late text for the Old Testament. It's probably written after the time of the exile, when they've come into contact with it. This is, a, this is written as a, uh, a, a polemic against ancient Babylonian creation myths, which would have been very... Ancient Israelites, uh, ancient, really at this point, Judahites, Jerusalemites who had been in exile, like Ezekiel, would have been <clears throat> worried that their God had died in battle. Our city was destroyed. We saw our temple get burnt to the ground. Our God died. Marduk won. We should worship Marduk now. The authors of Genesis 1 are saying, no, no, don't, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't just like, you know, let go of Yahweh. Um, Yahweh's bigger than all. There's a reason for all this. And if you actually read uh, more of, of the, the, the work of the author that we associate with Genesis 1, you'll see this is part of a much larger polemic about how God is in charge of the whole earth. And in fact, the destruction of Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem uh, and the exile of the people and so on is actually part of this kind of much larger, bigger plan that has to do with the goodness of the world. Um, but, but here they're trying to say, look, the world is not chaotic. It's not out of order. Yahweh didn't die or lose. Yahweh is in charge of the whole earth. And in fact, God's got bigger plans the, than, than just uh, what happened in Jerusalem. So it's a way of recontextualizing, but also um, pushing back against uh, maybe some even uh, Israelites who would have said, OK, let's just go ahead and, uh, and start worshiping uh, Marduk. So, uh, um, uh, so, so God uh, makes these secret, uh, the birds and so on, and God creates great sea monsters, and, and God fills the, the earth and uh, the, the, the seas and the sky. In verse 22, God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas. Let the birds multiply on the earth. It was evening and morning and the fifth day. So God says, okay, now again, just like the seeds, God is creating the, the, the uh, animals and the plants and the, the birds and the fish, everything, so that it can continue on its own. God has set up the world so that it can it can grow and progress um, without God kind of making everything happen all the time. In verse 24, God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. Okay, again, filling the, all the spaces that God has already made. And then God made the wild animals of every kind and so on, and God saw it was good. Verse 26, then last, last thing God does, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, our image. Remember what, the, what is the image in the ancient Near East? It's an extension of the presence of something. So let us make humankind in our image. And the, the uh, plural pronoun there. Our, yeah. So uh, we'll get to this again next week, but this is part of ancient Israel's pr progression from being uh, polytheistic to monotheistic. So ancient Israel, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a sort of trajectory that takes several stages. One of those stages is that Yahweh is just one God among others, but our God. One stage is Yahweh actually is the high God of the pantheon. Um, and the next one is that there really isn't much of a pantheon. It's Yahweh and then angels, which are really kind of like images of God. Like God works through divine apparitions in a way. That's, that's, that's the kind of progression. And we're here at a point where there probably are other deities assumed, um, but they're not real deities. They're like God's helpers. They're divine beings, like what we would think of as angels almost, with the, the kind of do God's bidding. But we're made in the image of, of Godness itself, right? The high God, Yahweh, and, and included in that, um, these uh, kind of divine helper beings. What are called the Malak in ancient Hebrew. Um, that's the, that word really means messenger, God's messengers. So angel also just means kind of a messenger. Um, so in any event, uh, so God says, let us make humankind in our image. So we are extensions of God's presence in the world, just like an image of a God. Remember that gardener walking around who was like the image of the king? We're the, we, we were made, we were stuff that was made into the image of God. We're an extension of God's presence on earth. Um, uh, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Why do we have dominion? That is like ownership, rulership, because we're images of God. Like God runs stuff. We are the ones who are supposed to be images of God kind of helping run stuff on the earth. And this has often been taken to mean like dominion, like cruel dominion, like we can dominate, we can do whatever we want to the earth. We're supposed to, like this, God made this to be nice. So God wants us to keep it nice. Like this is a kind of like, good kind of uh, rulership or whatever. Um, over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So everything we're supposed to take care of. So God created humankind in his image, and in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. So th what does God look like? Us. Yeah, God's a kind of bigger version of us. Again, anthropomorphic or whatever, God. Um, but we're really, in this version, we're, anthrop we're anthropotheic. Like we're, we're, in, we're in God's image. Like we, we're images of what God looks like. Also male and female. The understanding is that like the panoply of human existence actually reflects everything that God is. So God is not a guy. Like in the ancient tradition, God, there are guy gods and girl gods. 
right? God's, and like, even like in the Baal story, you'll read about uh, Baal's member. You'll read about like his, his actual genitalia. Like they'll talk about the guy's genitalia. They don't do that in the Bible. Uh, they do say that like, male and female forms reflect God, uh, but there's this kind of, God's almost kind of beyond gender in a way in the, in the Hebrew Bible. That's part of this monotheistic progression of ancient Israelite thought. Um, so in any event, we're made in the image of God. God blessed them and told them to be fruitful and multiply, just like all the other uh, beings. Uh, fill the earth, subdue it, like, you know, have control over the earth, but take care of it in that way and have dominion of fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living thing. And God said, hey, I've given you all this plant to eat. By the way, we're created vegetarian. Uh, humans get to eat meat after uh, Genesis 9 and the story of Noah. But here they're supposed to just eat trees and fruit. Uh, verse 30, it's every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, and everything that creeps in the earth everywhere that has been given the breath of life. I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that he had everything he made, and indeed it was very good, evening and morning, the sixth day, and so on. This is creation according to ancient Israel. Now, we don't have time to read it right now, but Genesis 2 and 3 are another creation story. It starts really in verse 4. This is the last thing I'll tell you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll head out. But uh, verse 4b, actually. So if you look at Genesis 2, 4, and then you'll see a heading, another account of creation, or you'll some other heading, right? It starts, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens... Just that, it's that same beginning. When God created the heavens, this is the beginning of a creation story. This is a different author from a different time, probably a few hundred years prior. This is probably comes from the era of the monarchy as opposed to the era after the exile. When no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. There was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth. We're getting another version of the creation story. Now, if you want to, you can go read this this week, sometime Genesis 2 and 3, and you can think of how it actually is a very different way even of thinking about creation than Genesis 1. It's giving us a slightly different theology, and actually, I love it. In Genesis 2 and 3, God's got hands and feet. God walks in the garden. You think about Genesis 1, God is pretty transcendent. God stands away from the earth. God doesn't touch anything. God speaks things into being. It just happens, right? We're made as images of God because God's not here. Genesis 2 and 3, God is there walking in the garden in the, in the heat of the day and so on. God speaks and talks with the people. It's a very imminent understanding of God, very anthropomorphic understanding of God. And ancient Israelites preserved both of these creation stories. They didn't erase one of them, throw one of them away. They, they weren't idiots. They realized that these things were not entirely consonant with one another. Genesis 1, and, Genesis, uh, 1 says humans were created last. Genesis uh, 2 and 3 say humans were kind of created like first, but also last because Eve came after, way after Adam, right? So there's a, a very different um, sort of uh, understanding uh, in the history of, uh, uh, of Israel over what, even when humans were created. But both of those were preserved in ancient Israelite tradition. They were both preserved precisely because they thought that this enriched their theology. And my argument is it does. We have a transcendent God in Genesis 1. We have a very imminent earthly God in Genesis 2 and 3. And for some reason, both of those needed to be preserved in Israelite tradition. And for both of them, for both Genesis 1 and 2 and 3, humans are not the servants of the gods that are here to like feed God. God doesn't need food in Genesis 1 or 2 and 3. What God wants is humans to function as extensions of God's presence to the earth. So we'll pick that up again and talk about pantheons next week. Thanks. Thank you.